You know, last week in uh, the sermon, I, I referenced one of uh, my favorite movies, Princess Bride, and that, uh, you know, those, those opening uh, segments uh, in that scene where the people keep coming up to Vicini and saying, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? And his answer every time is inconceivable. No way it can happen. Well, of course, those things keep happening. And so after a few of them, Inigo Montoya comes up to him and says, you, you keep using this word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And we applied that to worship last week, that here's a word that certainly as Christians we use often. <laughs> we talk about worship. And we looked at it and we saw it means a little more than maybe we thought it means. It's not just specific actions. It's not just, oh, worship, that's singing and praying and reading the Bible. And you know, Those things are acts of worship, but worship at its heart is this idea of focusing on God and putting God first and relying on God. And so a little different than maybe we thought. Well, today we're going to look at another key Christian word and concept. And I got to thinking, could it be we don't know what this word means completely either? You know, another word that's this important to us and we don't know what it means? Now, that'd be inconceivable, right? Well, let's see, because uh, that's what we're going to see today. And the other thing, as I was looking at this, and this is a point I keep emphasizing, you know, the Bible is a book inspired by God. Sometimes we focus on the inspired by God and we forget it's a book. And it doesn't mean there's parts in it that, you know, sometimes people, books, that means fiction. No, it's all true, but God masterfully inspired it and put it together in the way a good book is put together. And so the thing that I get from that is if God wanted to convey that, hey, people, here's a subject that it's going to be very easy to miss the heart. You know, what would be a good way for an author to convey that? And a good way would be as if you have someone who's known for that subject, almost you know, the expert in the field. If you have him, get it wrong. You, you show that. Because that would show all of us, well, if he can miss it, maybe I'm missing it. And that's what we're going to see today. We are going through this series, God's First Words to Christians. The, the book of Matthew, not the first book of the New Testament that was written, but the first book, if you open up the New Testament, there it is. And so my thought is, what did God want us to see at the very beginning of the New Testament? And we're seeing definitely this idea of some foundational, fundamental truths that we are to build on as Christians, our, our whole Christian life. In chapter 1, we saw the idea that God has a plan and we have a part. And the, the lesson that we, we, we got that from, or the, the passage we got it from, talked about God's plan to bring his son Jesus, the greatest plan of all, and Joseph's part. Well, we all have a part in a plan that God has for us. And then last week, we saw the first part of our part. You know, God said, all right, here it is. I, I have something for all of you to do, and it started with the idea of worship. You know, to really be used by God in his plan, we have to truly worship him, not just do the things that are associated with worship and worship services, but to put God first and focus on him and rely on him. Well, today, it's going to build on that. It's not just going to be parallel. It's going to, be, it's going to build on this idea that, all right, if we put God first, then here's what it means to repent. Yeah, we're in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, you should have seen that on the outline. should be ready for that. So let's go ahead. I want to read the, the verses first. I think it helps us give some context, and then we'll go and look at them. As we're doing it, though, remember, especially in a passage that has to do with a story, look for a wait-a-minute moment. Look for a moment where you say, wait, if this, then why this? Or something a little out of place, it seems. So verse 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. 
The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, does something strike you as a wait-a-minute moment in that passage? It just seems a little out of place. Spirit of the dove, maybe you weren't expecting that. Descending like a dove, so is, that's something we maybe weren't expecting. And the, voice. the voice, again, that's, that's different. John was pretty bold with the Pharisees and Sadducees. John was bold with them. Uh, you know, here he is, and he definitely comes down hard on them. I think it has to do with John. Who else was he bold with? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Jesus comes to be baptized, and what does John do? Yeah, yeah. yeah tries to deter him. It says it tries to prevent him in another translation. It's like, this is Jesus. Shouldn't like, if he says jump, you ask how high? That's what I got from this, and I thought about it. Again, I think it's the key to really unlocking this passage. It's really seeing what it is that God wanted us to get from Matthew 3 is this action of John that at first just seems a little out of place. So let's look at it. Let's break it down a little bit. In those days, verses 1 and 2, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So here's the first time that we see John the Baptist. And what's the first word out of his mouth? Repent. And it's the first time we see this word repent in the New Testament. And who's saying it? John the Baptist. So there's this link. John the Baptist is known as the prophet, the preacher whose focus is repentance, that he's the expert in the field. And it's going to set up something we see later. Now, also, what you get from that, it says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In other words, you need to do this thing because of this. And look, we see that again when you get to verses 3. Verse 3, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. So John the Baptist didn't just happen on the scene. God had prophesied. He said, there's going to be someone before the Messiah, the special person comes. There's going to be a person, John, getting ready for him. Prophesied through Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So again, there's that idea of prepare the way for the Lord. Because the Lord is coming, do this. Prepare the way. You know, make straight paths, and it plays on the image back then of a king. You know, if a king was coming, you'd try to make the, the roads as well as you could because, you know, think of how they traveled back then and things. And so you try to get everything ready for them. This person deserves that. And there's the idea here. Two, two times we see this. Because of this, because the kingdom of heaven is coming, it's appropriate to repent. Because the Lord is coming. I think that's one of it, and we're going to get to that and see. I think there's definitely something where he's got some good reasons, but there's a part that doesn't make sense. And this is, this is what sets up why it doesn't make sense. He's coming. This person is so great. His whole ministry is because Jesus is coming. His, everything is prepare the way for the special person. He's setting it up uh, because it's appropriate. And this is how I say as well, chapter 3 really builds on chapter 2. Chapter 2 is God deserves worship. He deserves to be first. He deserves our focus well, then you get this idea of repentance. Repentance follows that. The times that I haven't done that, I need to repent of those. And we're going to see that more and more. Verse 4, you probably heard, have you heard this about John the Baptist? His clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. I suppose we're small. We should have done that. That should have been like the morning snack today. Some locusts, wild honey, and we'll see who's really into this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not seeing many people. 
Now, you know, we probably all, we've heard that, and we thought, why in the world? I mean, maybe he's just a strange guy. Well, here's what I think it is. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Even though we read about him in the New Testament, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they actually, everything in them takes place, you know, prior to the New Covenant, which starts in Acts 2. So they're really, they're in the New Testament because they're leading into that, but they're under the Old Covenant. He's the last Old Testament prophet. And one thing about some Old Testament prophets, sometimes God, to help emphasize their, their message, would have them do physical things that would be like a, a visual for the people. You know, it's called, they're called action prophecies or action parables. You know, Ezekiel, one of the Old Testament prophets in chapter 5, God says, I want you to shave off your hair and your beard. And then I, I want you to take all that hair and divide it into three piles. And the first pile, you're to burn. And the second pile, you're to hit with the sword. And the third pile, you're to scatter into the wind. And it was because of what was going to happen to the people of Jerusalem. It was a way to visually, as he got ready to tell them, visually sort of illustrate for those visual learners in the crowd. Oh, okay, I get it. Well, that's a little bit like John. His message really is you need to live differently than you have been living. And so <laughs> what's he look like? <laughs> and what's he act like? Someone who physically lives differently. And so that's what it is. It's helping us get the point. Well, verse 5, uh, he was pretty popular. It says, People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, you might wonder, like, why do so many people come to him? Especially if you just say, hey, confess your sins. But he was popular. And the reason is because the people knew that he was preparing for the Messiah. And they had this expectation. It was the, the chief, really focus of Judaism is there is this special person coming. This Messiah is coming. And even they knew it was he was coming about this time. Because there's a prophecy in the book of Daniel that gives like a time element. And you start it and it just keeps going and it comes right up to this time. And so they knew the Messiah was, was about ready. He was about ready to come. And so the people were anticipating that. We've been, you know, our ancestors have heard about it for hundreds of years. Now he's finally coming. And so the people were excited about that, and it says John was baptizing them. And uh, I think we realize baptism means immersion, going all the way under the water, and we're going to see that played out here. And he was baptizing them for repentance. That's the same act that we, if you've become a Christian, have gone through. You've been immersed in water. But it was a little different focus in terms of his was just for, it was a sign of I repent. Jesus adds to it forgiveness, because forgiveness wasn't truly possible, fully possible, until Jesus died on the cross. It's the same physical act. That's what he's doing. And as they're doing it, they're confessing their sins. And this is a key here. That's our usual focus. When we think about repentance, it's usually that idea. I confess my sins. You know, I, well, I lie, I steal, I do this, I cheat. Whatever it is, all these specific things. And that isn't wrong. The thing is, it's not complete. And that's what we're going to see in this passage. It's what he's going to show us now. And it, the funny thing is, to show us, he uses the Pharisees, of all people that we can learn from. But he, it's God, the author, is going to show us. Repentance isn't just confessing specific sins. And to prove that, I give you the Pharisees. And look what John says. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. You know, what a preacher. You know, like, you like, you come, hey, you brood of vipers, how you doing this morning? <laughs> Who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So they're basically saying, hey, we are good with God just because we are children of Abraham. And John says, nope, <laughs> God could make these stones into that if he wanted to. And then he says, the ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to even carry he will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire his winnowing fork is in his hand and he, he will clear his threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire now we could spend a lot of time on this and i've been i've spent a lot of time myself researching this baptism of the holy spirit and fire uh, i'll just say this the the fire element that's not this the baptism of the holy spirit is mentioned in all four gospels matthew mark luke and john only Matthew and Luke include the phrase and fire. And that's because there, there's a, a positive element to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For us as Christians, it's a blessing. But there was also a judgment element for the Jews. 
And Matthew includes it because his gospel was focused on the Jews. It was written to the Jews. So they certainly needed to hear it. And the judgment element goes back to, it's a judgment on national Israel. The, the nation as a whole, not individual people. The nation as a whole, anyone who identified themselves with the nation, and it's carried out in the year 70. If you remember your, you know, just world history, Romans destroy Jerusalem in the year 70, and that's really what this part of it was. Well, and the reason for it, it goes back to what I said. You know how all the Jews had an expectation that the Messiah is coming, he's going to set up his kingdom? Well, the problem is they, their expectation had gotten off track. And they had the whole Old Testament, and it said the Messiah is coming. It said he's going to set up his kingdom, but it also talked about its nature. And they sort of picked and choose, and they said, I like this verse, but not that one. This verse, but not that one. And so they had come to think that the Messiah's kingdom was going to be two things. First of all, it was going to be physical. In other words, the Messiah was going to come. He was going to set up his throne, literally, physically, in Jerusalem, just like King David had done. And for them, since Rome was occupying them at this time, it also meant, well, if he's going to set up his throne, that means he's got to kick the Romans out. So they were just sure the Messiah was going to overthrow Rome. And then the second aspect of it, for them, it was going to be national. And in that sense, nationalistic. It was only going to be for Jews. Now, if you read through the Old Testament, it makes it clear, no, it's not going to be either one of these. But again, they sort of ignored those verses. And the Jewish leaders were the head of this. They were f driving the nation, and the Jewish people liked it too. We're going to see Jesus' own disciples. You know, they're all for it. Yeah, hey, physical kingdom, Jews only, would count us in. But the Jewish leaders especially, they were linked to this national structure, and they were unwilling ever to give it up. And really, even that flows from last week, remember? Because what do we see about the Jewish leaders? They put themselves first instead of God. So it just makes sense that when it comes to what they want, they're like, here's what we want. We don't really care what you want, God. And so the nation as a whole was going to be judged for that. Now, the thing that really plays for us today and helps us in our theme of what is true repentance, that's what it says in verse 6 about people. It says they were confessing their sins. And as I said, that's the usual idea of repentance, isn't it? Repentance, I confess this, 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 and this. Well, here's something about these Pharisees and Sadducees that might be a little surprising. They didn't have a lot of sins to confess. Again, that might be surprising because they're like the bad guys of the, the New Testament, aren't they? You know, they are Jesus' arch enemy. And so they're just so, e you know, they're the villains. The hiss. You know, that's what you do when you hear Pharisees. But they didn't really have a lot of sins to confess. And here's how we, we know that. Here's where I get that from. In Philippians chapter 3, and if you look on your outline, I've included some of the extra verses. This is Paul writing, and you remember Paul, before he became a Christian and a leader of the church, he was a Pharisee. And as he looks back on his life, here's what he says. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. Now, he's not saying he was perfect, but he's saying, you know, the, the typical sins, the, the lying and stealing, and, you know, they had ways that things they didn't consider stealing that Jesus called them on, but just out and out stealing or lying or some of the sins that people, you know, were known for, they didn't do those things. They were very, in one sense, they were good people. So they didn't have a lot of sins to confess. But was, it, was there a problem? Again, they put themselves first. Yeah. Pride and not, lack of humility, and I put myself before God. We saw this last week when the wait a minute moment last week is they didn't even go see the Messiah. Here's these magi, like, hey, the one you've been waiting for. We know where he is. It's here. They're like, yeah, okay, bye. I didn't even look at it. They, they put themselves first, and of course, all throughout the, the Gospels, we're going to see that. Well, that's their main sin, and here's where I say it, it all builds on each other. Last week, we saw as as people, we need to worship. God is the creator of the world. He deserves to be in a category all by himself, and we deserve to put him first. Well, if that's the fundamental action that should characterize us as people, certainly as Christians, then the fundamental sin is not doing that. It's not just that I lie or I steal or this or that. It's like I put me first instead of God. And so the fundamental element of repentance is not just I confess lying, stealing, ang getting angry, I confess, God, I have been putting myself first and not you, and I'm going to stop. I'm going to put you first and live for you. And that's what these Pharisees weren't willing to do. They didn't have a lot of sins to confess, but they had that main sin, and they're never able to let go of it. And it's why they're Jesus' arch enemies the whole time. They are uh, opposing God himself. 
And they eventually come to realize that. But it's because they're not willing to put God first. So if you look on your outline, the central question, there's always one. It comes a little later today because we needed to define the terms. I asked the question, am I committed to living for God first, which is what repentant is, or to living for myself better? And I called that reformed. And here's, here's the idea. I think a lot of Christians... You know, people who aren't Christians, they, they hear about it, they, Jesus, it makes sense, and they make a commitment, I'm going to live for God, but really what it is, is I'm going to stop doing this, this, and this, and I'm going to start doing this, this, and this. In other words, I'm going to live a better life for God, but it's still me that is ultimately first. I've chosen on my terms to quit this and quit this and do this. And so it's not surrender, it's more a retreat. I'll give up these certain areas. You know, it's certainly not unconditional surrender that whatever it is you want, God, I'll give it to you. You know, it's like negotiating. And we may not think this, you know, it's not like we actively do it with God, but, you know, it's like, okay, God, I'll give up this and this, you know, because I can see, but not this one here. You know, may we compromise. It's like, God, I'll give up these things. Certainly you can't expect me to give up everything. You know, rationalize. Hey, nine out of ten, that's pretty good, God. You know, this one area here, certainly, it can't be all that bad if I hold on to that one, can it? And it's like, you know, if you were to use an illustration, it's like we're negotiating with God about a contract, how the contract's written, and once it gets the way we like it, then we say, all right, I'll sign it. No, repentance isn't like that. You know, repentance isn't even letting God write the contract without any negotiation and then us signing it. You know what repentance is? It's a blank sheet. And we sign the blank sheet. (laughs) And we say, God, I am totally surrendered to you. I'm not even waiting to see first what you say. Whatever it is. As a matter of fact, we don't even know when we sign it. When we become Christians and make that commitment, we don't even know what it's going to be down the road. But we sign a blank sheet that says, God, whatever you write on that, whenever you write it, I have already committed. That's repentance. You know, and that's what the Bible talks about for disciples. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. See, there's two things there. First of all, Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple. He doesn't force anyone to be a disciple. Now, notice disciple and Christian are the same thing. A lot of people today think, oh, I became a Christian and had my sins forgiven. That discipleship option, I'm, I'm going to leave that. That's like the extended warranty on the car. I'm going to choose not, you know. No, they go together. If you're a Christian, you're a disciple. And Jesus says, that is totally your choice. I won't force you to be a disciple. But then look what he says. Whoever does choose to be one, he must deny, they must deny themselves Take up their cross daily and follow me. We choose whether to be a disciple or not. We don't choose the nature of discipleship. We don't come to God and say, I'm going to be a disciple and here are my terms, God. No. You must deny yourself. If you're denying yourself, who are you putting first? God. Take up your cross. We know where that image comes from, don't we? Do you think someone the Romans were going to crucify could negotiate? Yeah, I'll carry the 30-pound, you know, cross, but I I just won't do the 50-pound. That is too much. I I refuse. No, they didn't have any say in the matter. And that's what Jesus is saying. When you become a disciple, you give that up. You commit 100% to that. You know, it's interesting, these things that we've been seeing, you know, these first two chapters, they go with our purpose. You know, we, we talked about this in the opening life group. Our purpose from creation, we have two things that as... Christians were to do. And the first one comes not even being a Christian. Just from being created by God, our first purpose is to worship. Because God is who he is, because he's separate, he's the creator, I, my purpose in life is to worship him, to declare, God, you are different, you are worthy of everything I can give you. And then our second purpose comes because we've been saved, we've been redeemed. God, because you have saved me, and I've gotten away from worship, I've gotten away from putting you first, I commit to being a disciple, to getting back more and more closely to this, this model that you have for my life. I commit to following Jesus and living more and more like him. And we saw that in chapter, you know, the first chapter of Matthew is we've got a part. Second chapter, well, your first part's worship. And third chapter, your second part is this idea of total surrender, repentance, discipleship. They go together. God is setting the tone for everything. Now, 
as we look at this, maybe this is new to you. Maybe the idea that repentance encompasses more than just being sorry for, you know, stealing and lying and this or that. Maybe it's new, but doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it all make, just sort of flow? It's like, okay, if I really believe there's a God, you know, how can you believe there's a God who is above everything and created everything and then still think, yeah, but that's fine, I'm going to live for myself. It just makes sense. If there's a God, I should worship him. I should put him first and not me. I should focus on him. I should rely on him. And then it also, I think, makes sense that if I haven't been doing that, when I make a commitment to God, that I'm truly repentant. I say, God, it's not just these specific things I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop living for me and start living for you. I think it makes sense. And I think there's even a part of us that there's some things we desire to change. You know, I I know me. I've struggled with anger. And even after becoming a Christian, I want to get rid of that. You know, I don't like what it does to me. I don't like what it does to people around me. There's some things I want to change. But I also know, and you might identify, there's some things I don't want to change. And the wild thing is, sometimes even the thing I want to change, I get in a situation where I have a chance to change, and what do I do? I rationalize. Oh, well, it's okay to be angry in this situation. I mean, who wouldn't be angry here? I mean, I'm totally justified. What is that? Yeah, but there's a part of me that knows, and that's okay. To me, that's like the, the first level obstacle to growth in this area. Is like, I realize in some area I'm putting me first. I don't want to change, but I know I should. And I'm starting, I'm trying to trust God. He's in control and he loves me. I'm trying to change because I realize there's an issue. But as usual, there's a deeper problem. And this is where John the Baptist really comes in. Look at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Again, for me, this was the wait a minute moment. Because John is arguing with Jesus. He he recognizes he's the Messiah, and he argues with him. Now, I, I will say this, there's, and a lot of people will come up to me after either on the same day or maybe at a life group, and, hey, I had this question from your sermon. So I, I found one that could be a potential question, so I'll try to answer it in advance. In John chapter 1, verse 33, and John was a book written by one of Jesus' disciples named John, but here it's talking about John the Baptist. John 1, John the Baptist says about Jesus, I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John is saying there, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who the Messiah was until he was baptized and the Spirit, the dove came down on him. But now in Matthew, it seems like he knows who Jesus is before he baptized him, and that's why he's a little reluctant to baptize him. How do you, how do those two go together? And and here's what I think. I think what it is, is John is saying, I didn't know from the very beginning, even though I'd heard about my cousin and remember Jesus and John are cousins. Like I'd heard there was some strange stuff with his birth and different things, but I'd never put together he was the Messiah. But it seems like just prior, you know, when John is there baptizing and he knows part of his purpose is to reveal the Messiah, it seems like he knows right when Jesus is there, oh, this, it makes sense, you're the Messiah. And then the baptism definitely confirms it. When God speaks and the, whole, you know, the dove, that's like, okay, absolutely. Seems like maybe another shade of meaning how you harmonize these two is when John the Baptist says, I didn't know him. He's saying, I didn't fully know who he was. I knew he was going to be a special person, but I didn't know he was going to be the son of God. Because realize, they, they were expecting a Messiah. They didn't know he was going to be God in the flesh. And that's definitely a theme of the Gospel of John, is Jesus is God in the flesh. So it seems that what he's saying, too, is like, I didn't fully know who he was until this voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Like, oh, he's even more special than I thought. But in this case, I think he did know, and it makes sense. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But here's here's why it struck me. He just said in verse 11, I'm not even worthy to carry the Messiah's sandals. I mean, think about that. That's like the lowest servant. Would you want to carry someone else's sandals? I mean, in those days, these aren't the designer sandals. These are what you wear day in, day out on dirty streets. He's like, I'm not even worthy to carry them. There's other translations that says untie them. I mean, that's the lowest of the low servant. He says, that's where I compare to the Messiah. And then he argues with him. (laughs) Like, I can't carry his sandals, but I can tell him you're wrong. No. How is that? And like you said, did he have some good reasons? You know, well, if the Messiah is so exalted, the person baptizing typically is above the person being baptized, you know, in sense of, I, you know, whatever. And so it just isn't appropriate. It isn't right. But still, you've just said, you are all this. <laughs> I'm below you. How do you argue with someone then? 
And I think this is the key there. John didn't even see, didn't even realize that those two don't go together. To say you're so exalted and then argue. And here's, here's why I think this is the key to this idea of repentance. John is certainly aware of specific sins. He knows it's wrong to lie and steal and all these things. And I think John as a whole is pretty well committed to doing what God wanted him to do and not doing those sins. But he's got this one area. His expectation of the Messiah. And for whatever reason, he says it'd be wrong for the Messiah to undergo this baptism. It just My view of the Messiah, he shouldn't do it. And he's, at first he sticks to that. Here's what I expect the Messiah to be. This doesn't fit. I'm not going to agree with you, Jesus. And that just, you know, as I look at that, here he is, the expert on repentance, preaching repentance, and he's not fully repentant himself, and he doesn't even realize it. He doesn't realize there's this one area, and if there's one area, what's that mean? It means it's not a blank sheet. You know, it means there was an asterisk. You know, he signed the blank sheet with one asterisk, except, I'll do anything, God, except this, except change my expectation of the Messiah and your kingdom. And here's the thing, John's not rationalizing. He does, he's not aware. It's not like he says, God, I've committed and surrendered to you in nine out of ten areas. This one, I'm standing firm. At first, he doesn't even realize he's doing it. And I thought about that for us. We might not realize. We might not see in ourselves. You know, but if there is one area of our lives where we're not surrendered, well, that means that myself is not surrendered. That there is something. I'm reformed, maybe. I, I've got a better list of things I do for God and don't do. But I'm not truly repentant. And I can, as I thought about it, again, I try to anticipate. You know, what do I think? What would you think? My first thought was, well, gee, that seems a little hard on John, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, he seems like a pretty good guy. It seems like God would be happy. If we were all as good as John the Baptist, don't you think God would be happy? And then I looked at this and thought about a couple things. I wrote them down there. Two things I wrote, the one and two. What if John hadn't given in and baptized Jesus? Here's this one area, and we all look at it and say, ah, but in general, he's pretty good. What if he hadn't given in and baptized Jesus? Let's read these next verses, 15 through 17. Jesus replied after John tried to prevent him, Let it be so. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And again, I think part of that is Jesus saying, I need to commit to God. I haven't done anything wrong, but I need to commit, surrender my very self to him, because he knew there would be times in his life that would be tested. So to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. How nice of John. And they're like, okay, I'll, I'll agree with you. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, which again tells us a little bit about the nature of baptism. It's not sprinkling or pouring. He went under the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. If John hadn't baptized Jesus, we wouldn't have this thing that, like you were pointing out, how amazing. It wouldn't have happened. If John had stood firm and said, no, <laughs> this isn't what the Messiah should do. I'm not going to do it. We wouldn't have the baptism. And look what it says in John 131. John's looking at his ministry and he says this about it. I myself did not know him, the Messiah, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John the Baptist is saying, my main reason for baptizing People knew it was about time for the Messiah. Other people had been claiming he, they're the Messiah. My main reason was to reveal him. That something special would happen so the whole nation would know this is the guy. Now, they got off on their own track at times, but at least the foundation was there. God said, this is my son. If he hadn't baptized that, baptized Jesus, he would have missed that. You know, John's part in God's plan. And you know, we talked about the first week. We all, God has a plan and we have a part. This was his part, and he almost missed it because he wasn't fully repentant. And then I thought about us. We have a part. And if we're not fully repentant, what if we miss it? What if there's some part of us that says, God, I'll do just about anything, but not that. God says, well, that's what I had for you. <laughs> that was your part. And sometimes we don't know our part. I thought about last week. Remember we looked at the Magi last week and they brought these gifts? Remember what those gifts were used for? It doesn't say, but we sort of put two and two together. What happened to Joseph and Mary right after the Magi left? They, they had to... They had to go to Egypt. I guess Joseph and Mary were poor. We see this from the sacrifice they offered for Jesus when he was born. They didn't have a savings fund for a trip to Egypt. It was those gifts the Magi brought. 
Now, what I thought was interesting, God didn't tell the Magi, I need you to go and take these gifts because this special child, he's going to need the money. No, he just said worship. And they just came to worship. And they didn't know what was going to come of that. And the same thing for us. We need to worship. We need to put God first above all else, be repentant and put God first, not ourselves, because we don't know what God's going to call us to do. But if we put him first, we'll always be, in, we'll always be ready for it, won't we? And so that was the first thing. You know, John's so good, yeah, but if he hadn't done this thing, look at what it would have messed up. And the other thing that I think applies at times even stronger, later on, as, as committed as John is at this point, later on, John comes to doubt Jesus, you remember? Matthew chapter 11. He says this. He asked Jesus this question. Actually, he has one of his disciples ask Jesus the question. He says, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? He's just said, you're, the, you're him, you're it, you're all that. Well, later on, he comes to doubt it. How, why did he come to doubt? Was it because of lack of evidence? Now, God the Father spoke from heaven. That's pretty big. It says right before that in chapter 11, Jesus was doing miracles. That's pretty big. It wasn't a lack of evidence that caused John to doubt. It was his expectations. You remember where John was and the reason he couldn't ask Jesus in person? He was in prison. And so his problem wasn't evidence, it was expectations. He's thinking, if this guy is the Messiah, and I'm the special one who was prophesied to get ready for him, the guy getting ready for the Messiah shouldn't be in jail, should he? <laughs> That's not how it should work. When the Messiah comes, I, I'm not saying, that, you know, I have to be, you know, exactly up on a pedestal, but I shouldn't be in jail. And so he started to doubt. Are you really the one? <laughs> this doesn't seem like what should be happening. Doesn't that fit us sometimes? We get in situations. And it's not that, hey, I'm really doubting now if the evidence for Jesus and his resurrection is true. No, we're in a situation, and it's not going the way we expect. And this is where I think the fact that we repent of specific sins makes it even harder. Because you know what? We come to God, and maybe we've been Christians for a while, and we say, God, I've stopped doing this, this, and this, and I've started doing this, this, and this. I am a much better person, and look what I'm going through. Because we've repented of sins, we haven't repented of the main sin of putting myself before God and thinking I can hold on to some area, including my expectations of what life should be as a follower of God. And so when the tough things come along, they shake us. I, God, I wasn't counting on this. I, I, this shouldn't happen to a Christian. And maybe we have our lines like, God, okay, this little thing, but not this. You ever find yourself in that situation that you got these lines like, oh, God, that's too much. It's because that's an indication we haven't fully surrendered. You know, today, it's like we saw last week. The focus of worship isn't the specific actions. It's the, our heart. And the focus of repentance isn't specific sins, it's our heart. And we're going to see that throughout the whole New Testament. God wants our heart. If we give him that, the, the actions will follow. And so let me wrap up. What do I need to do? You know, and it's funny, they've been the same thing for a few weeks now, but because we're at this level, first of all, I need to examine. If, you, if we came in here today thinking, oh yeah, I repented when I became a Christian. Believe, repent, be baptized. I'm good. And then today we realize, wow, repentance means more than I thought it means. You need to examine that. You need to surrender to God and say, God, I'm open to whatever it is it means. And maybe you need to get with someone I put there on the sheet. Maybe you need to get with a close friend and say, hey, can we talk about this? Because I, I don't know if I can see it myself. If there's an area about myself I haven't been seeing, maybe I can't see it unless you and I talk some. Second, then I need to apply God's control and love. God, this scares me. Maybe I'm starting to see this area of life, and it scares me to think of giving that up to you. I need to really know you're in control and you love me. And then the last thing always is trust God and just do whatever it is he's calling you to do. When you realize being fully surrendered means this, it means giving up this, it means doing this, we've got to trust God and just do it. And what will that look like? Well, I thought about it. I think a lot of us have been trying to live the Christian life with an asterisk. And you know what an asterisk means when you read something? You look below and you see the exceptions, don't you? You know, this covers all these things except, and you look below. Well, I feel like a lot of us are a Christian life. God, I commit to you. And we put a little asterisk, and we look, except for this, this, and this, of course. And maybe we didn't even realize it. But that's what it means. That's what it can look like, is living the Christian life 
God has for us. And so as we start to think about that, and again, we won't spend a lot of time, but we've had some great times at the end of uh, the sermons starting the discussion, and I put a question there. Because this is really the key to a lot of this, is we talk about giving up control and surrendering. Why is it so hard to give up total control to God, knowing what we know about him? In other words, we know that God sent his son to die for us. We know that he, he's in total control and he loves us. Shouldn't that be enough that whenever we're faced with a difficulty, we just say God's in control and he loves me and just check it off immediately? Why do we still struggle at times? We know that on one level, but at least me, uh, maybe not you guys, <laughs> but I still struggle. Like, oh God, this is making me nervous that this certain area of life is going this way. Makes me nervous that you seem to be calling me to do this thing or stop doing this thing. 